If I could have your attention, please. Robert Higgs is Senior Fellow in Political Thought at the Independent Institute. He's the author of eight books, uh, the most famous, in my opinion, being in the best, Crisis and Leviathan, uh, his most recent being Depression, War, and Cold War. Having received his PhD in economics from Johns Hopkins University, Bob has taught at the University of Washington, Lafayette College, Seattle University, and the University of Prague. His articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, Financial Times, and many, many other publications. His talk is entitled, <laughs> War and Leviathan, The Trick That Works Every Time. Please welcome Bob Higgs. I actually, I actually um, supported the... Thanks so much. Very kind of you. What's that? Bumper? Up anywhere? No, I don't. I've said this some parts of this before. It's a great honor for me to um, have been invited to speak at uh, this conference. What's that? Uh, many of the other speakers are old and cherished friends of mine, and uh, uh, people for whom I have the highest uh, respect, and Hi, good to see you. Uh, whose work uh, see has you. You? taught me. Uh, a great deal over the years. Here, uh, uh, Ralph so Rako, by the way, uh, what? I always refer to as my favorite historian. And I, uh, I've spent many hours listening to uh, Ralph's lectures and always with great pleasure and, and with edification. Uh, among the speakers here, uh, I just want to single out a couple because uh, uh, as splendid as, as they all are, there are two uh, that seem to me to be genuine American heroes. And that uh, notion is thrown around very loosely nowadays, but uh, there are heroes, and we have two on the program. Uh, and uh, they are Daniel Ellsberg and Karen Katowski. So. I, I, I'm very happy to, to pay homage to those two individuals who who had the courage and the integrity to do the right thing in a way that made a big difference. I'm gonna talk about the growth of government in my uh, address today. It's something I've been studying for a long time. And uh, so you may have heard remarks similar to this before if you've heard me speak. Uh, if so, I apologize, but I think the message remains germane today. And so I'm going to Repeat it again. Margaret Atwood's poem, Siren Song, begins, this is the one song everyone would like to learn, the song that is irresistible, the song that forces men to leap overboard in squadrons, even though they see the beached skulls. Our rulers know how to sing that song, and they sing it day and night. The beach skulls are those of our fathers and our sons, our friends and our neighbors, for whom the song proved not only irresistible, but fatal. The state is the most destructive institution human beings have ever devised. A fire that, at best, can be controlled only for a short time before it o'erleaps its improvised confinements and spreads its flames far and wide. Whatever promotes the growth of the state also weakens the capacity of individuals in civil society to fend off the state's depredations and therefore augments the public's multifaceted victimization at the hands of state functionaries. Nothing promotes the growth of the state as much as war. Randolph Bourne's statement, war is the health of the state, has become a cliche, not simply because it is pithy, but above all, because it expresses a vitally important truth. States 
by their very nature, are perpetually at war. Not always against foreign foes, of course, but always against their own subjects. The state's most fundamental purpose, the activity without which it cannot even exist, is robbery. The state gains its very sustenance from robbery, which it pretties up ideologically by giving it a different name, taxation, and by striving to sanctify its existential crime as legitimate and socially necessary. State propaganda and long-established routine combine to convince many people that they have a legitimate obligation, even a moral duty, to pay taxes to the state that rules their society. They fall into such erroneous moral reasoning because they are told incessantly that the tribute they fork over is actually a kind of price paid for essential services received, and that in the case of certain services, such as protection from foreign and domestic aggressors against their rights to life, liberty, and property, only the government can provide the service effectively. They are not permitted to test this claim by resorting to competing suppliers of law, order, and security, however, because the government enforces a monopoly over the production and distribution of its alleged services and brings violence to bear against would-be competitors. In so doing, it reveals the fraud at the heart of its impudent claims and gives sufficient proof that it is not a genuine protector but a mere protection racket. All governments are, as they must be, oligarchies. Only a relatively small number of people have substantial, effective discretion to make critical decisions about how the state's power will be brought to bear. Beyond the oligarchy itself and the police and military forces that compose its palace guard, somewhat larger groups constitute a supporting coalition. These groups provide important financial and other support to the oligarchs and look to them for compensating rewards, legal privileges, subsidies, jobs, exclusive franchises and licenses, transfers of financial income and wealth, goods and services in kind, and other booty, channeled to them at the expense of the mass of the people. Thus, the political class in general, that is, the oligarchs, the palace guards, and the supporting coalition, uses government power, which means ultimately the police and the armed forces, to exploit everyone outside their class by wielding or threatening to wield violence against all who fail to pay the tribute the oligarchs demand or to obey the rules they promulgate. Democratic political forms and rituals, such as elections and formal administrative proceedings, disguise this class exploitation and trick the masses into the false belief that the government's operation yields them net benefits. In the most extreme form of misapprehension, the people at large become convinced that owing to democracy, they themselves are the government. Frequent individual passages back and forth across the boundary between the political class and the exploited class testify, however, to nothing more than the system's cunningly contrived flexibility and openness. Although the system is inherently exploitative and cannot exist in any other form, it allows some leeway at the margins in the determination of which specific individuals will be the shafters and which the shaftees. At the top, a modest degree of circulation of elites within the oligarchy also serves to mask the political system's essential character. 